Well, it is half past two now, and so we will make a start. And really a warm welcome to every single one of you that's joining us today, literally from all over the world. And what an amazing day to join together to talk about leadership development for nurses and midwives on International Day of the Nurse and also Florence Nightingale's birthday. My name is Professor Gemma Stacey. I'm the Director of Academy at the Florence Nightingale Foundation. And myself and Greta Westwood, who is the CEO of the Foundation, are going to introduce you to today a very, very exciting innovation for us at the Foundation. And that is our first of a series of books from the Foundation all around on this particular one, Leadership Development. So if I could just start with telling you a little bit about the, the background and our motivation uh, to, to publish this book. We have worked in partnership with Elsevier and we're very aware that there are lots of books already out there on leadership development. But those of you who are aware of the Florence Nightingale Foundation will know that we have what is known as a very unique approach to developing nurses and midwives specifically. And rather than keeping that very unique approach to a very small number, my CEO, Greta Westwood, identified three years ago that we should be really extending our reach and allowing far more nurses and midwives access to these ideas and approaches to developing themselves as leaders. And that's where we formed the Academy. And the Academy is achieving those things. It's going from strength to strength. But our real vision is that every single nurse and midwife across the world should have access to this approach to leadership development. And that is why we have gone down the route of publishing this book in collaboration with Elsevier and all of the various different experts that we work with at the foundation to deliver our programs. You will get opportunity to meet a few of those today and they'll take you through the background and also the, the important aspects of their chapter of their book. Now, if all was to go to plan, I would be saying to you, well, you could order this book today. Um, but unfortunately, also as a result of COVID, who knew that the, the pandemic affects the publishing world as well, we weren't able to have the book ready in preparation for today, but it is available to pre-order. And the, the publishers Elsevier have made all of their nursing and midwifery textbooks discounted for the whole month of May. So if you did want to pre-order it throughout May, they would be 20% off, off the book. So our, my job today is really to take you through that book and help you to think about why you might want to explore the ideas that we're presenting here, in here in more depth. What you should know is that this is not a traditional textbook that will introduce you to lots of theories or particular behaviours that are aligned with one approach to leadership. The premise is very much around your individual and personal leadership development. And that's true of all of the, the leadership programs and scholarships we offer through the foundation. So there are loads of case study examples of our alumni who are sharing their experiences and also reflective learning exercises. We'll also be encouraging you to make action plans as you go through the book to think about OK, what do I need to do now in order to put this into practice? So we hope that you would see this leadership development book as a companion for you at all different stages in your career where you can look back and identify the things that you want to focus on in terms of your personal and professional development. So our first chapter, you may not be surprised, but you may, is, uh, is focused around Florence Nightingale herself and her legacy and why this is particularly relevant to us as a foundation, but also to the wider nursing and midwifery profession across the world. This chapter is authored by the CEO of the Florence Nightingale Foundation, Professor Greta Westwood, who is herself uh, an expert and also, I would say, one of Florence's greatest fans. So I'll hand over to Greta now to tell you a bit more about that chapter. 
I must apologise for my slightly croaky voice this morning. We were up very late yesterday celebrating Florence Nightingale at uh, a very special event we, we hold every year in Westminster Abbey in London. So um, it's not a COVID throat, it's just that I spent all day talking um, and I've spent all day today talking as well. So um, thank you, Gemma, and everybody. I've seen where you where you are from around the world. It's incredible what what attraction this book has created. Um, and and well, you'll see later on the esteemed panel that we have, who've all contributed to each of the chapters. But I am going to say that I've got the best chapter. I had the best chapter to write. As the chief exec of the Florence Nightingale Foundation, um, it was an absolute, absolute delight to, to write this chapter. Um, a, a real dream for me. And I've always been interested in nursing history. So actually to delve deeper, a bit deeper into the relevance of Florence Nightingale um, as we, uh, uh, celebrate 202 years since her birth and, and why she's relevant today. So the, the bits of the, of the book that I wanted to portray to you to understand about her leadership, why it's relevant, is really to go back to her, her, her starting. So I wanted to take you back to her route into nursing, her achievements, her, her leadership attributes, and, mm -hmm. and again, as I said, why she's relevant today. Um, and then there's a small piece on the relevance or, and the importance of the Florence Nightingale Foundation, mm -hmm. a bit about the history, why we were set up, where we were set up and what we do today. So I think her route into nursing is quite extraordinary. And I think when I tell or when you read the chapter, mm -hmm. when I tell a little bit about the synopsis mm -hmm. of that chapter, mm -hmm. you'll understand that um, you might even be able to personalise that to you because not all of us have an easy route into nursing. Not all of us have always wanted to do nursing. Not all of us have, have wanted to do nursing, but our parents said it's not good enough. Um, and there's been a battle to get to that place. So um, to understand a little bit about that background, mm -hmm. I've just gone into her family history, her home, her schooling, her parents' expectations of her. And, and really, I think her roots stem from being in a very privileged white white background, very um, uh, privileged in terms of money, in terms of property. Her parents lived between two houses in England. Um, at, but however, whilst Florence was very um, curious all of her life, she soon realised that she was destined for what was, whilst it was relatively happy, her parents, she had a happy home, but she realised that her destination was going to be hugely dull if she didn't do something about it. She didn't want to live the life of a Victorian woman um, in, in her parents' home, in her own home, married to somebody who, who would expect her to stay at home. She wanted to do something else. And as part of her family home, there were uh, many little towns uh, which included poor houses that she went to visit with family members. And during those those visits to the workhouses, the poor houses, she was absolutely appalled about how dirty people were being treated in. Um, and at the age of 16, she, she had this calling, she had this um, intuition that she wanted to become a nurse. And so she battled with her parents. She, she used her family friends to get her a secondment um, in a hospital not far from where, where she lived. But her parents wouldn't let her to get let her go. Her, her family felt that the job of a nurse was a was that of a servant, and she was destined apparently for better things. So, um, sixteen, she had the call, but it wasn't until until she was twenty seven that she went um, to Germany with some family friends to understand a little bit about how nursing was delivered in this particular institution. Um, she came back, she definitely had the fire in her belly to want to do that even more, but her parents still resisted her, her ambition. And then eventually, um, one of her family friends, the wife who, whose husband later became the secretary um, for, for the war office in, in London, his wife found her a job um, as a superintendent, so sort of a senior nurse um, in an in a organisation in London. Again, hideous conditions, the patients were looked after, but she's set to rectify that. 
Uh, at that time, cholera was rife across the slums in, in London caused by um, bad sanitation and water supply. Um, and uh, in 1854, just when she, she'd been given this job, the war was declared um, in between England, France and Russia in the Crimea. And she knew then that she had to go and do something about this. So she arrived in, in Turkey, the Skutari Hospital in, in Turkey, in October 1854, and there she stayed until the end of the war. So again, the same thing happened when she turned up in Turkey. Uh, she knew she had to do something about it. And the reason I talk about Turkey, about her, her family's resistance to her becoming a nurse, is because her relevance today, I think, is that we have to break doors down we don't always got get what we want and she certainly didn't get what she wanted she had to learn very quickly about influencing and negotiating she couldn't do that herself because she was a victorian woman that wasn't permitted but she found people to do that for her and she used those those people in positions of power to get what she wanted she she this, this enabled her to get a royal commission to come and inspect the hospital in, in Skatari. Um, and, and she soon got support. She got what she wanted. And in the book, I have a letter that she wrote to the Royal Commission, um, absolutely pinpointing the conditions there and what she what was expected, what she expected of the Royal Commission. So she she kicked doors down, she she fell out with people, she wasn't an easy person to get on with, but she knew what she wanted um, and she never stopped there. She she was somebody who never are, um, took no for an answer and uh, and how she's relevant today is all of those leadership attributes that she um, that she portrayed I think we can see those in our great leaders now we find leaders we want to emulate them and I'm not, I'm not suggesting that everybody kicks door da doors down but but the, the premise of that is that um, we have to learn how to influence to negotiate to know where the power is in order for us to make a difference to patient care. And she always, always did the right thing. Whatever she did through the rest of her life, she died age 90, was always because she wanted the best for the people, for health, for pu public health, for health prevention. Um, and, and that's what she did. She never stopped. Once she came back to, from the Crimea, she never stopped writing, just as we do Twitter, thousand times a day she wrote letters ad nauseum hundreds of letters a day that was her way of of telling the world about the work that she was doing so it was a privilege Gemma to write this chapter um, and as Gemma said there are sections in there for you to think about your legacy what would your legacy be when you leave the profession what, what is there still left for you to do and a bit of a timeline for you to think about okay how do I chunk that up how do I Make sure, make sure that I do get to the place that I want to be. So um, Gemma, a privilege, thank you. I probably overrun, I could spend the whole of an hour and a half talking about Florence, but I'll let others have a say. Thank you. Thank you, Greta. And just to say to our audience that if you do have any questions for Greta or any of our authors, please pop them in the Q&A or the chat and we'll have some time at the end to finish. Just before we move on to the next chapter, Greta, I wondered what you thought about how important it is for nurses to understand the contributions of, of historical nursing figures like Florence, but also others like Mary Seacole that really have been trailblazers of their time. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, Gemma? For those who of you who are on the on the call, not from this country, our, our children in this country have the understand about Florence Nightingale and Mary Stiekel as part of their history but when it comes to our nurse education we don't understand we've not taught about those and it would be amazing if we could get that back into the curriculum I think because um, despite the fact that they were um, over 150 years ago actually the principles of their leadership haven't changed they they have they they stuck to their um, this, this they, they, they knew exactly what they wanted to achieve and leadership is about um, putting your head above the parapet and that's exactly what they did so I think whilst it was 150 plus years ago 
the, the significance is still the same today. So I, I agree, Gemma, I think we should. And um, if any of you got five minutes, it's the it, it, Mary Seacole's books. There's a, a new Mary Seacole book out, um, but certainly there's lots of books around Florence Nightingale. I think it gives you a real flavour of understanding how they managed to lead and get things done in those days. Brilliant. Thank you, Greta. So we'll move now on to our second chapter, which is a chapter that reflects a core element of all of our leadership programmes and, and also our scholarships. And that's very much about self-awareness, really getting that deep understanding of self and, and seeing that as what we would describe it as our superpower as leaders. So the more that we know ourselves and the way in which we commit to understanding how we are responding to different situations, communications with other people, the more effective we can be as leaders. So the approach that we particularly use at the foundation is underpinned by the Myers-Briggs type inventory. And Greta and I wrote a chapter introducing the principles of that particular framework and thinking about how that can be used in practice. Greta, would you share more about the MBTI approach? Yeah. Um, yes, this, this was a fascinating chapter to write as well, Gemma, because um, we refer always back to the work that we do in the foundation. And as Gemma said, it underpins everything that we do. So with the belief that the more you understand yourself, the greater the leader you will be and the greater the impact you will have on your team and therefore patient client care. So I just wanted to start with a quote, and this is the start of this is a quote at the start of the chapter and i think again it's significant today florence nightingale she said let whoever is in charge keep this simple question in her head not how can i always do this right thing myself but how can i provide for this right thing to be always done so she talks about understanding self in that but also the ability once you understand that there are some preferences in how you present yourself that aren't really your preferences and therefore it's easier therefore to pass that um, that task that that thing um, to the next person to do so the chapter really is as Gemma said it's about understanding self and uh, it we've mm -hmm. what we have done is we've broken down the meaning of the Myers-Briggs type into inventory for you to understand how you can apply that to your leadership style, but particularly understanding and the, the joy about, we let's call it the MBTI from now on, the joy about the MBTI is um, it's very quick to understand and the more you understand it, the deeper you want to understand it. So we've used this as a concept for our lead, lead, leadership signature um, and it really plays to the emotional intelligence and self-awareness that we that we lead. So um, when we talk about in, um, leadership signature, what we're really suggesting is that to be effective leader, you need to have a commitment to understand your personal values and, and your formative experience. So what is it that shaped you as a leader and your approach to leadership? And, and, and I guess a, a, an element of that is, who have you found in your career that's made a big difference on you? What was it they did? They exuded what strength? What sense of, um, of authenticity did they did they show to you? And why is it that you thought that that person was a leader? Can you can you pick out those leadership skills? Um, and so uh, we've got a, 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 this, as Gemma said that each of the sections, each of the chapters has sections in about for you to think about. So this is really um, the first part of this is for you to understand or start to think about um, th these formative approaches, how have, they have, how, how have they've led to your leadership style, what's been your motivator, motivator to become a leader, um, and what do you hope to achieve through your leadership? Um, and that starts whether you're a student nurse all the way through to the most senior nurse in your organisation. There's always still more to achieve. We're never, we're never the finished product. <coughs> um, and what attributes do you see in your in your colleagues and in your team members? What do you want to emulate, and how can you be more effective? <coughs> so it, we break it down into what is the MBTI. I could have to stop myself and go and get a drink. <laughs> is that okay? Absolutely, of course, no problem at all. I can pick up from here, no problem. 
agree to describing the, the chapter so brilliantly and one of the things that I guess is really important to say about this particular approach is that we acknowledge right from the outset of our, our ways of working that there are multiple voices as leaders and the MBTI principle is very much a strengths based principle so there is no one particular personality preference that is more advantageous than another we need all of the variety and the wide range of approaches and preferences within our leadership um, sphere of influence and that's important to acknowledge it's not it's not one particular approach that is favored over another it's very much a strengths orientated approach I am back. I think you've finished, Emma. Is that OK? Thank you. Thank <laughs> I'm you. Sorry about that coughing fish. Don't worry, don't worry. You've done a lot of talking over this last couple of days. Thank you. <laughs> so our next chapter, and I'm going to ask um, Johnny to, to join me on camera now, it comes from Jonathan Guy Lewis, who is one of the facilitators at RADA, the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, as well as being a highly accomplished actor, writer, director himself. One of the things that we, we incorporate into our programmes and scholarships is input from RADA, the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts. And I can consistently say that people who have been through these programmes and this opportunity describe it as transformational. They, they talk about this aspect being the area that they're most worried about, but the point where they feel it's the game changer for them. And it's a really unique perspective that as nurses and midwives, we're, we're not exposed to uh, typically in our development. So this is about how we have presence and how we have impact and very much builds on that self-awareness theme. Over to you, Johnny. Brilliant, thank you, Gemma. Well, what a build up. Uh, the bar is now set very high. So my little inner voice is now going, oh, I have to be brilliant. So I'm gonna have to kind of lower my bar to tell you about the chapter, which is developing presence and having impact. And just to preface that, I'm actually sitting in a dressing room in a theater right now, as we're in uh, a week of development for my new play. So if you hear any extraneous noises or sounds or music or singing, please forgive that. It, it's they're, they're all carrying on while I'm, I've am i nipped out to spend some time with you to, to explain that. And as Gemma said, yeah, my, my background is as an actor and a writer, a director, a teacher, a coach. And it's this idea and this understanding that we, we've been working with Florence now for nearly 10 years. And it's providing something incredibly important for nurses and leaders in the nursing community, building on this idea of self-awareness. And knowing how to do it is one thing, but then how do you actually do it? What are the nuts and bolts of that? What's, what do you actually have to do? What can you do with your body, your breath, your voice to have this impact? And I would say, and we would say it rather that in order to be truly authentic, you need to have some technique to be the best version of you. And so that's all that is. It's not trying to change you, turn you into actors, but it's understanding that there is a performance aspect to communication, whether you like it or not, whether you fear it, whether you embrace it. But actually, it's important to understand that it's a, it is pivotal in the way we communicate, that we, we need visibility and actually, as time goes on, visibility is becoming increasingly important in our leaders. So I've tried to create these chapters based on the course that we run with the scholarship. And the first part of this chapter, if you like, is looking at what do we mean by presence? What does that actually mean? Because we can look at someone and we could admire them and you know they've got presence and then we'll, our little voice will, I haven't, um, we'll let the negative um, sort of define us, but actually what are those nuts and bolts? What could we do? What could we give off with our body and our voice that would create that sense of presence for other people? And actually when we start to practice that, when we start to rehearse that, when we work from the outside in, we then do start to feel more confident. And that's the magic of it. This idea of rehearsal, practice. And so, uh, uh, rather 
what we do is we impart the knowledge and then we spend time practicing. Uh, now, in the book, just in my chapters, just like the other chapters, there are exercises to um, very uh, immediate things that if you try them and almost like going to the gym, if you practice them, you will start to feel more confident. So that's the first part. Uh, it's defining what, what we mean by confidence and presence. And, and then the next part of it, if you like, are what we call pillars of presence. So we go into more in depth around, in terms of our body language, what we're giving off. And if I was to say to you now, as you're sitting and listening, and please forgive me, uh, I don't mean to offend you, but how aware are you of your resting bitch face? And by that, I mean your listening face. Uh, because often we sit and listen and we're in our processing self, in our brain, as we're, we're, we're focused on what's being said. And sometimes we forget what other people are getting from that. Now, if you're in a position of leadership and I'm looking to you for affirmation and I'm seeing that furrowed brow and uh, someone who's focused on that, who isn't aware that there's an ambiguity to that to me, I might be scared. It might worry me. It might make me feel anxious. It might switch me off. It might think that you don't care or that you've got something more important to do. And of course, that's the far, it couldn't be further from the truth in your head. Coming back against this idea of self-awareness, because the more self-aware you are, the more choices you have around behaviors. And it's actually only when you look at your behaviors that you can affect other people's. And as a leader, talking about Myers-Briggs, your personal preference, we, we have a personal preference, but then how do we flex that style? We might never feel totally comfortable as perhaps more of an introvert being on the stage and in the limelight, but you know what, with practice and some what I call scaffolding, we can start to feel better about doing it. So it might never feel natural, but I want you to rethink natural as habit. You position it in your head as it feeling natural, but actually these are just habits that we learn over time. And we can look at that and we can reframe habits. So that's what the, the, the two chapters about, how we, how we define presence, confidence, and then how do we create some scaffolding for each of you in your own way to be the most authentic version of you. And that's about letting go, actually. To have control, you have to let go of control in order to find the control. But if there's a rigidity to that control, if there's a tightness to your machine, your body and your voice, often we don't have enough breath. And actually breath underpins everything. Often when we're in our thoughts, we forget to breathe. And I bet you as soon as I said the word breath, you became aware of your breath. And that's exactly what happens. So self-awareness at the heart of that is this idea of breath. And like any machine, the cogs of any machine, the pistons, the wheels that make it work is oil. And when there's oil, enough oil, the machine works effectively and we just focus on the output. We don't worry about the machine. But as soon as there isn't enough breath in our machine, then things start to go wrong. The little inner voice can start to get louder Imposter syndrome can start, can kick off. Lots of negatives, dry mouth. Uh, that's your machine literally saying, I don't have enough oil in my machine. So the work that we do and the work that you'll see in the chapter is giving you some tips and tricks, some very, very basic things to cope with fear, for example. So how to prepare for success and how to flex your com communication style and how to be affirming as you listen, how to value and affirm, and not just other people, but how you affirm yourself. So I wanna leave you with one quote, it's a Henry Ford quote. If you think you can, you can. If you think you can't, you can't. But either way, you're right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johnny. And I know over the years, Johnny, you've had huge experience of working with nurses and midwives through the Florence Nightingale Foundation. Have there been particular themes to the challenges that you've identified that really relate to the professions that you've worked with? Yes, I have. And drawing on this idea of imposter syndrome, it's a big one. 
uh, and you know often promotion happens as a nurse because you're good at nursing mm -hmm. the other bits you just either learn or or don't and hopefully you have a, a good mentor or something you to to develop these but i think it's a human trait to have imposter syndrome to you know someone's going to find you out uh, and how how you you know how you're kind to yourself i think is an important one and in this day and age when there's such a spotlight on the nhs uh don't make a mistake um th there's an anxiety i want i want to get it right of course i do but if we're if we're kind of stuck in that place it, it affects everything we do it affects the way we think um and finding that ease and flexibility and having that in your body your breath your voice uh, you know, we're animals, we're, we're a herd animal, we collect together in tribes, we're sniffing this stuff out all the time. Can I trust her? Do, do, could I go to him with my problem? And, you know, you're all carrying so many things, spinning so many plates, that of course it becomes really difficult to sort of be in the moment with each piece of communication, because you're thinking three steps ahead or you're, you're you know, helicoptering out and being strategic. But that sense of um, imposter syndrome, they're going to find me out, especially in a, in a leadership role with, a, with the executive, uh, and I've got to represent nursing, so the stakes are high for me. All of those things can start really creating that, that constricting uh, mindset. And then, you know, it really doesn't help. Mm -hmm. So that, for me, Gemma, is, is the big one that keeps coming up. Um, but how, how do I find my authenticity? I, I, I know I'm, we, we talk about authenticity, but what does that actually mean in the way that I sound or in the way that I deliver my messages? And, you know, we have a preference of style of communication. And if we are more analytical or introverted and detail orientated, you know, the idea of standing up in front of people to hold the limelight, to hold the space is terrifying. And we avoid it. We let someone else do that. I, I'm much better in the background. So what I'm trying to do in the chapter is say, yes, some people have an aptitude for that. Some people might, you know, in their Myers-Briggs be, that's, yes, they're very happy to do that. But actually we can all get better at communicating because at the heart of any piece of communication, at the heart of any message is trust. Do I really trust what you're saying? Do I trust you? And so sometimes I'll forget to listen to the message because there'll be something at the back of my mind saying, I'm not sure that you believe what you're saying. So how do I believe it when you're not sure yourself? So it's those often little things that we can do that all add up to become bigger than the sum of its parts. Uh, and um, yes, getting to ask the right questions. But that, that's the big one for me is that, is that imposter syndrome. It comes up time and time again. Um, particularly post-COVID with the pressure that's been on the nursing community. Um, it, it, you, know, it's, it, there's, you know, there's a lot of work to be done to, to restore faith and confidence and affirmation uh, in nurses generally, uh, and particularly in the, in the leadership, uh, because we want to keep nurses. Uh, you know, we want to keep them infused and, uh, and, and passionate. And, uh, you know, I, I love the work that I do with, with Florence. It's some of the, the most rewarding work that I do. So anything I can do to, to help in that is, uh, is a great privilege. Wonderful. And isn't it fantastic through the chapters that that will reach so many more nurses and midwives across the world? Thank you so much, Johnny. And we could even hear singing in the background there. So we totally authentic. <laughs> Thank you so much. So we'll move on now to our next chapter, which um, is written by Pippa Goff. Now, unfortunately, Pippa wasn't able to join us today. And the reason for that is, as well as Pippa being one of the most phenomenal and talented leadership coaches and um, organisational development facilitators that I have had the privilege to work with, she's also vice chair of the NSPCC. And today is a really important meeting for them in their, in their calendar. And so she would have loved to be here, but wasn't able to. And so I have offered to share with you the content of Pippa's chapter. So one of the areas that we do focus on is in the programmes is how we can create cultures which are underpinned by this term psychological safety. And that's a term that recently we have heard so much more frequently it's like as a result of the pandemic 
the world has woken up to the importance of our working environment being one where people feel able to seek help, to share their challenges, their concerns, and also do that in a context where they don't feel fearful that there'll be negative consequences to them if they do do those things. So where we show our vulnerability as clinicians, but also as leaders, that we are actually role modeling courage and encouraging our teams and our colleagues to do the same. But it's a really tricky concept to actually think, how do I turn this into a practical approach? How do I create an environment of psychological safety? And one of the methods that we teach all of our leadership programs as participants and our scholars is an approach called co-consulting. And that's a peer group approach to coaching each other. It's not about being a professional coach or bringing in an external facilitator. It's about giving you a method that you can work with with your teams so that you can guide them through a process of in-depth reflection. And the evidence shows us that where we can really embed a coaching approach into the nature of our conversations, where we open these, uh, offer these very exploratory and open questions to help people really look to themselves to find the answers and really explore the resource they have within them, to be able to find ways through difficult situations. That's when we really start to influence the culture of our organizations. And this doesn't have to be hierarchical. It can happen amongst peers. It can be a method we teach to students in early career, nurses and midwives. It can be a method that's used by our executive leaders as well. So this is a, a, a method that has great evidence base for really starting to make a difference to the way it feels to work within organisations and having fit spaces that specifically focus around a reflective learning opportunity. So Pippa is a real expert in this approach and she shares her expertise in a way that is uh, is. Um, manageable for you as a as a reader to think about how you might practice and implement this approach within your own ways of working so it's not just about the theory it's a very much of a, a how-to book and, and Pippa does encourage you through lots of different exercises to think about the skills that you would want to develop in order to develop that coaching approach so that is our fourth chapter and very much building on from our fourth chapter is our chapter that focuses around leadership specifically in anxious times. Now, when we were when we were constructing this book, it felt very relevant. We were at the point at the earlier stages of the pandemic where there were so many unknowns. And what we saw amongst our leaders that we were supporting was those that were able to navigate through and support their teams when there were no clear answers and, and there was a very specific approach to doing that. So I'm thrilled to introduce you to Amy Hart, who is one of the founders of the, another wonderful leadership development consultancy that we work really closely with called Heartridge. And Amy and I have delivered webinars on this very topic and tried to share this knowledge as widely as possible, because we really believe this gives people the tools, don't we, Amy, to, to not lead, not just during times like the pandemic, but the, through the constant challenges we face. So Amy, please do tell us a bit more about your chapter. Thank you, thank you so much, Gemma, and Greta, and everybody. Um, it's a, such a privilege to be here on International Nurses Day. And what a, um, what, what a great thing to be talking about at the moment, given the leadership that is required from our nurses and indeed from our NHS. Um, as Gemma said, we wanted to make, so our intention for this chapter was to make it very current, very practical, very short. If you're anything like me, it's a job to even get my wordle in in a day. So it's, it has to be short and it has to be useful to you. And the, the other thing that's really important is that it's accessible to any type of leader. 
So I've been asked today to talk for five minutes um, around three key areas. So one being about what is the chapter about, the second being about key points that are important about the chapter, and the third being about what's the kind of learning and the, and the take home messages. Um, so the chapter's about, there's four elements to the chapter. One is about the job of leadership. So we talk very much about leadership is about creating direction. It's about aligning your activities towards that direction. And it's about keeping commitment and engagement from your people at any level. So I always say you wouldn't get into a taxi and say where you didn't want to go. And you also wouldn't get in a taxi and be quite ambiguous about your destination. You'd probably be quite purposeful about it. And yet we forget that sometimes with a leader. So it's creating direction, whether that's daily, weekly, monthly, a discipline of knowing where you're headed. The second bit is about, obviously, your um, aligning your activities around that destination. And the third is keeping and retaining your staff. The second part of the chapter is about challenges of leading in anxious times. So we know that a number of organisations have both been led in a, in a way that people are um, anxious and also that anxiety exists in terms of the people that are accessing that organisation. The third part of the chapter is about the impact of effective leadership in organisations. And that's, that's brought from a variety of sources and a, for, for a variety of organisations that we work with and Florence Nightingale works with. And then the fourth bit is about tips and methods to support people. The, the book starts, so you start with the Florence Nightingale quote. Uh, this part of the chapter starts with a quote from Shackleton, which I love, which is, if you're a leader, a person others look up to, you have to keep going. And that is the key about leadership, is sometimes it's really, really hard to even get up, to think about what am I, what am I doing today, um, to have that sort of sense of, sense of self in everything that we're doing but it's so important if, particularly if people are looking to you we talk a bit about arousal we talk about arousal in sort of terms of anxiety and heightened anxiety and what that means for people in organizations and we talk about tools that you can use when you're aroused as a leader so we talk about what do you need to do if you're feeling anxious what are the things that will serve you well to keep you keep you going as a leader and to keep you sharp as a leader. Um, in fact, I think it was uh, Mother Teresa that said about, if you want to keep the lamp burning, you have to keep oil in it. So there's something about how do you ensure that you are, um, that your well-being is matched within that. And then we talk a bit about learning for never events. So we talk about uh, some of the events that have happened over the last couple of decades particularly the role of compassion in organisations that was brought out of the Francis, the Francis inquiry. Um, and then in terms of the learning for people, some of the learning from reading the chapter is about hopefully that it will affirm the things you do already. So we, when we talk about the tips from the chapter, we talk about really understand the context that you're working in, how you need to be as a leader, what's important, to, to you as a leader? What's important to that organization? The, we are very, very privileged to be Florence Nightingale um, Associates, and we are also very privileged to be working with other organizations. And we always talk about, we, we work in service of that organization. So whatever that organization is trying to do, how can we help those leaders achieve that? So you as leaders need to understand your context. You need to understand the job of a leader. What is the job of a leader? I, I talk quickly about it, but really, really, fill those shoes of being a leader. Um, very often on programmes, we talk to people and we've done it as part of the scholarship, put your hand up if you think you're a leader. And it's still really interesting, the people that don't put their hands up. The third tip is about know yourself. So um, Gemma, Greta, Johnny talked beautifully about preference. Preference is very much your right hand. It's stuff that you just do without thinking about it. Your left hand, if you're, if you're right-handed, your left hand is much more your out of preference. So what do I know about myself? What do I do naturally? And what do, what do I need? What needs more energy? What needs more time? What needs more concentration and practice? That's a key part of being a leader. Doesn't mean to say we can't do the spectrum of the activities, but some might take more energy. Know your people. So know the people around you. Know the people, Johnny talked about trust, really, really important in terms of leadership. Know your safe space and know your people that you are working with and to. 
And the final thing is about keeping work and life in balance. Really, really important as a leader. So John Adair talks about put yourself first, then your team, and then the task falls out the end, as opposed to thinking about the task and forgetting your own well-being and, and that of your team. I say that, um, and it's out there, it's everywhere. Gemma, I think you started talking a bit about it. Everyone's saying it, I'm not sure everyone's doing it. So that well-being bit, I just want to really push in terms of being really important. So in a nutshell, if you read this chapter, when you read this chapter, when you get this fabulous book um, that is written by this fabulous organisation, Florence Nightingale, and everything that it stands for, and all the contributors, everybody involved, um, we hope that it will be practical for you. We hope it will be current to your context. We hope it will be useful. And more importantly, we hope it will be validating in terms of the, the role that you play anyway, every day as a leader. That's all I wanted to say, I think, if that's okay. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Amy. Just before I let you go, one of the things I, as you know, we, we really advocate at the foundation is that sense of you are a leader at all stages of your career. So it's not just about having a title that, that would indicate to others that you have leadership responsibilities. But I know you've worked with us with nurse and associate student nurses right across the spectrum. Do you have any particular thoughts around that sense of, of leadership is everybody's business? It's a really good point. And it's, that really speaks against the Francis Review. Because one of the things that was missing in that organisation was everybody taking responsibility. So I remember, so just a very quick story. So I was for a number of years vice chair of our football club. And that was the hardest job for me because I knew nothing about football. So I had to lead that club in a way that was very much around values, very much around behaviours, very much about being a role model without knowing anything about actually what the organisation was about. So I, I draw on that example. So whilst I was in a leadership role, I guess it taught me that you can lead in any context. You don't need to even know it. But there's something about the behaviours and the attitudes and the mindset that you have as a leader that are really important when you go into work. So even if you're a band two, and I hate, the, I hate bandings, but if we were to use that example, what you're doing every day, how is that making a difference? How is that making a difference to the organisation? And how can you role model that? And that, for me, is about being a true, a true leader. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Amy. Pleasure. Thank you so much for asking me today. It's been, it's been great. I just wish we were all in a room together. I know, I know. Not too long, hopefully. Thanks, Amy. Okay. Okay, so we're moving on now to the next section of our book. So as you've had, you will have identified, this first section has been very much about self. Um, we're now moving on to the next section of our, book, of our book, which is about influencing change. So how do we make change happen? And, and unfortunately, Catherine isn't able to join us today. He's the, he's the author of this uh, chapter. She is the managing director of an organisation called Eden and Partners. And we work with Catherine and Eden and Partners to really help our leadership programme participants and also our scholars to develop their political acumen so that they can and they can have an influence. Now, you might be thinking, I'm not interested in politics or this is not a chapter that I would particularly align myself to or feel all that motivated to access because we hear so frequently from nurses and midwives that they consider themselves as, um, as distant from or separate from uh, political influence. But actually what this chapter does is flip that completely on its head and helps us to see that we are in our work as nurses and midwives continuously acting and influencing as political agents. And we really do need to understand how we can use that influence and that, and that power that we hold as professionals to make positive change, where we can understand where our levers are, the relationships, the networks that we need to build to start to see the change that we want to see happen. So we're really starting to challenge some of those limiting beliefs that we perhaps put on ourselves or are imposed on us as a profession, break through those things and really see the, the power and influence that we can have. 
And again, Catherine does this brilliantly in a way that she describes and gives examples of nurses who have had success in this area and have really shown that it is possible for, for nurses and midwives to be in the, in the highest influential positions when it comes to political influence, but also how as student nurses, early career nurses, we also have opportunity to influence policy in our local environment, our regional environment, through understanding the system and understanding the language that we need to use. Now, one of the great things and the sayings that Catherine uses, and actually Greta said it right at the beginning when she was talking about Florence, it's really understanding about how to get stuff done. And that's the simplest terms that, that we can use to describe this chapter. She's given you the tools to understand how to get the stuff done that really is the, is the areas that puts the fire in your belly and you really want to see that change. She's helping you to get a roadmap as to how you would take that forward. So I can't recommend this chapter enough. I think it's something that we rarely expose ourselves, again, in traditional education to, but it, it is uh, for many, many of our scholars and leadership programme participants, a total reframe of how they've, have conceptualised their role as nurses and midwives. So brilliant chapter and, and highly recommend. Now, along the theme of getting stuff done, I want to introduce you now to Claire Henry and Susanna Scholes. And, and Claire and Susanna work with us at the foundation around bringing the principles of influencing change to life. So taking what might be seen as a, a theoretical um, model of change but, and turning that into something that feels applicable to everyday practice as nurses and midwives. And again, working across the whole spectrum of leaders. So first of all, Susanna is going to tell us a bit more about the chapter. And uh, I think, I believe, Susanna, you have a slide. So shall I move on to that slide? Yeah, I think... I think Claire's coming on first. Claire first. Over to you, Claire. OK, th thank you um, so much, uh, Gemma. And it's been, um, and Greta, and it's been a real privilege to be part of um, writing this chapter um, for this book. And it's just going to be great to see, see everything together. Um, what our chapter is very much, as it says here, the art of science of influencing change and measuring impact. And I think what we wanted to set out was a really practical approach because there's so much out there around um, quality improvement. And we just want to say, what do we mean by quality? And one of the key things for, for like the rest of colleagues with their chapters is that we wanted to really base it on real examples that scholars have done um, through the leadership program, which is it's our chapter is packed full of examples of, of what is real, what, what people have used. What we want to do is demonstrate the importance of quality improvement for nurse leaders in health and care. And really want, what, we're, what we're trying to put across is very much about making quality improvement real and doable. We've got lots of practical exercises um, and using a lot of ref reflective practice and learning. And one of the key things that we feel really strong about is that curiosity. Hence, we've got this picture because we want you to be curious and stop before you start. What are you actually seeing in the picture? Are you assuming things? So being curious and actually standing back, think, what are we really seeing? So really, really looking at that. So understanding what we're looking at. What am I what am I doing? So that's one of the things that we put across the model we use, because I think quality improvement can be made really complicated. We like simple. So we're using the model for improvement, which really helps and can hang on all the elements. So what are we trying to solve? What's the problem we're trying to solve and developing that aim statement and being really clear what it is we want to do. And then we're using a very systematic approach and then thinking like colleagues have already said, it's all about people. It's how we work with people as leaders. And I think quality improvement is a really important thing because what we do is you can't do it on your own. It's about a team. You need all of the different characteristics and we talk about different ways. No one is better than the other. You need everybody to make quality improvement successful. So we talk about qualities of curiosity, engagement, involvement, understanding and say one size doesn't fit all, you need to bring different elements together. I'll just hand over now to Susanna. Another 
um, um, important part of quality improvement is that um, a, approach around studying. Um, and it's using data to review evid use evidence to see what is working, what doesn't work. If we think about it, Florence Nightingale was a statistician um, and also a nurse leader. Um, and she actually confidently collected data and used data to persuade others. We heard the stories from Greta um, about how she persuaded others. And a lot of that was based on um, statistical analysis and her focus on improving decision-making for patients. Um, and I think that's quite interesting. She was both a nurse and a statistician. Um, and our experience, that's Claire and my experience. And there is um, research that backs this up as well, is that not all nurses and not all nurse leaders have the confidence in using statistics and numbers. Um, and the reality is some people actually some nurses shy away from numbers, especially those that are not part of patient care. The sort of management -y type numbers, the quality improvement numbers. Um, so that's um, 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 an interesting thing from our perspective. So what we're really trying to encourage um, nurse leaders um, and midwifery leaders is to be curious about how you feel about data and numbers. Start off with how you feel, and then that can break down some of those barriers and then go on to, um, um, the chapter goes on to help you to see um, data differently to support decision making. Um, this also opens up greater opportunities to be working with information analysts, people like myself, and making stronger and more balanced quality improvement teams. Our focus is always on the end point, better decisions with data, with qualitative and quantitative data, answering that really important question when I make a change, is it an improvement or not? Should I adapt, adopt or abandon um, um, my ideas? So with this, um, once you have um, good strong evidence, then you're really focusing on how to embed and sustain that. So we, we talk about quality improvements um, in a cycle. Um, 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 this is called Plan, Do, Study, Act Cycles of Change. That is the structured framework. Um, and with that cycle comes the qualities and attributes of, um, of, of leaders in quality improvement. Claire's talked about curiosity, reflection and learning. Being curious about what is possible from trial and error. So um, we feel, and as Claire, Claire already mentioned, we built our chapter on the experience of others, and you've had a chance to read um, some of the um, experiences of using quality improvement in practice um, from the um, Florence Nightingale alumni there. So very much thank you to those who have helped us to contribute. So we invite you to be curious about our chapter. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Claire, Susanna. I wonder if you could give a, a couple of examples of some of those standout changes Claire, Susanna, that you've supported some of other, the FNF nurses to implement through the programmes. Are there any that you think really that was a great example of, of quality improvement in practice? Um, it's always hard to pull out one example. Yeah, I can imagine. And, and the, I mean, one of the ones that really um, struck um, me personally was um, an example that came from mental health nursing. Um, and I think it was, um, I can't remember the, the um, nurse leader's name, unfortunately, um, but they um, had the experience and they saw um, um, an example where a patient um, lost a very precious football top because it had become soiled um, and it was something that was very close to his identity. Um, and off the back of that, he created um, an engagement and around a whole approach around um, ensuring that patients um, were able to have a secure locker for their items that are precious to them and start building up that sort of cultural ethos. Um, Claire, I think you might have um, some other examples. Um, 
think there's been there's been there's been as Susanna said there's been so many. I think one was um, around um, looking at frailty and looking at um, assessing frailty and actually understanding what was out there to start with. So I think what we've noticed with a lot of the examples is we've seen lots of tools used and suddenly thinking which is the right one to use and and getting people to stand back and go what's the problem I'm trying to solve not just about implementing say an assessment tool so i think that's from across the board that's what i've really noticed and one other one that really stuck out which is really simple because what we're trying to encourage people to do is start really simple you can't change the world in a few months you might think you can with quality improvement but it's taking your time so one of the ones was was around um sharp spins and actually they were using increasing number of sharp spins and what they found was that wrong things were being put in sharp spins. So they were using four to six sharp spins a week, um, um, a month. Actually, when they started to move bins, and they put, you know, sort of did lots of very simple things. The sharp spin usage went down to two. Now that was costed out, and actually, if that was S, that was spread across the NHS, it would save millions. That little project would make massive. That could make massive difference. So I think what I'm encouraging people to do is start small and see what you can spread, get it right. Do the, use the PDSAs to get it right. So there's some really, that's one thing, just very simple, small things to start, but my goodness, couldn't they grow? Absolutely, great examples. Thank you so much, both of you. And as Claire and Susanna said, that chapter particularly brings in the voices of nurses and midwives who have implemented change. So it's a very uh, real, authentic example of, of how every single one of us can and should be doing these things. Thank you both. So carrying on, on along the lines of the theme around change, one of the things that we've really championed at the foundation is the nurse and midwifery role in driving the digital transformation agenda. So historically, nurses and midwives were the recipients of digital transformation. They would be asked to implement uh, various different system changes, new technologies. It would impact on their practice probably more than any other professional group, but they were rarely influential in the design, the selection, the implementation, and all of those aspects that make these things actually successful in practice. So we are so proud of a partnership that we have developed with Jane Dwelly, who is the, the chairman of, of CHIME, which is an international organisation of, um, of, of, of pushing and driving leadership in, in, healthcare, in healthcare change through digital. So Jane, over to you. Thank you, Gemma. Good afternoon, everybody, and happy International Nurses Day to all our nurse colleagues on the call. Um, I was so pleased to be asked to write this chapter because it gave me the chance to bring together in one place everything I've been working on in the last many years uh, to do with leadership and also digital health. And um, it was a fascinating thing to be able to draw those elements together and come up with some really strong recommendations for the way in which nurses and midwives can start to think about digital health as a core part of their practice. So I start the chapter by talking about data or information and with the observation that data tells us how something is, but it doesn't tell us why. And then I draw the link between the amount of information, the huge amount of information that nurses and midwives gather about their patients every day and how in doing that, they build a very complete picture of their, of their patient, which uh, enables them to then work out the best care plan for that individual. And uh, when you add to that collection of information and data, and you add to that things like technology, uh, health IT, uh, hardware, the cloud and data analytics, what you get is digital health. And digital health was defined by the World Health Organization in 2019 as the process of using information technology to improve and ultimately transform patient care. And I often say that one day we'll stop calling this practice, this effort, digital health, and we'll just call it health, because all health in the future will be digital and digitally enabled. And so it's part of our, our duty as healthcare professionals now to make sure that the people we work with and indeed ourselves are um, getting ready for this revolution in, in the way we deliver and plan and commission healthcare. 
So in this chapter, I talk about specifically about nurses and midwives, because I do believe they have got this unique position amongst healthcare professionals because of their number and also because they see more patients than any other healthcare professional. And as I already said, they build this amazing picture around their patient based on their experience as clinicians and also the data which they collect. And this leads to five main elements uh, of improvement in patient care that digital health underpins. So I talk about these in the chapter and I'll just tell you what they are very briefly now. The first one, of course, is patient safety and a very important part of every nurse practice, nurse and midwife practice. And with digital health, we are able to employ things like um, AI and other ways of using observations to make sure that the patient is kept as safe as possible, that their uh, observations are uh, routinely uh, maintained. And I'm getting to the point now where because of the, the data we're collecting and the longitudinal data sets that are developing, we, these machines and our, our computers can uh, understand and identify a risk to a patient uh, long before a healthcare professional um, has, has also come to that same conclusion. Also, good record keeping leads to better patient safety. Uh, you know, less patients are lost to follow up and their, their, their history and their medications and allergies are more accurately recorded. And that takes risk out of every healthcare encounter. One thing that all nurses will recognize when we talk about um, digital health is the burden of administration they are under all the time. And if we can automate some of those those um, those burdensome bureaucratic processes, then we can release more time for nurses and midwives to care for their patients and take that routine work off them. And of course, once you are uh, uh, making an all data collection electronic, you are, of course, building um, better data sets. And that leads to a higher quality care because we understand more about the interventions that we are delivering and how and how they've been received and what those ultimate outcomes were. And that in turn leads to our fourth thing, which is patient centered care. If we are able to understand more about a patient and use digital technology to understand more about their condition, we are able to then deploy things like genomic medicine and very targeted um, patient interventions that can more effectively treat their condition rather than um, trying a wider range of therapeutic um, responses to whatever they're in front of you for. And one of the most interesting things I've found uh, in my work with Chime and, and also with the Florence Nightingale Foundation is the way in which by introducing digital health and the um, the way it democratizes everything that um, the, the access to data and the access to patients' observations and also their, their, their records, it leads to a new thing called, which we call a therapeutic alliance. So the relationship between the clinician and the patient is subtly changed and most importantly becomes less paternalistic because you're involving that patient in their care by letting them see their record, by letting them take their own um, observations, known uh, diagnostics, possibly on uh, hospital grade diagnostic tools, which they're allowed to use at home. And they become better at looking at their health and making the right choices for that. So that's the argument of the chapter. But then, of course, this is all about leadership. And so um, I then move on to talk about the ways in which uh, I believe nurses um, have uh, this ability to introduce digital health into their practice and into their organizations very much because they are nurses and midwives and have already got to that point where they're thinking about evidence-based care, they're thinking about the results of, of their interventions, and they have always got this focus on the patient and the way in which nursing informatics and technology can support better clinical decision making. And I talk a little bit about this in the chapter because these are long held nursing values, as you'll all know. And it seems to me that by giving nurses the opportunity to develop a specialty in uh, what you might want to call nursing informatics, or you might just want to call it digital health, the name doesn't matter. What's important is the way in which nurses can start to establish themselves as leaders because they are able to demonstrate ways in which the things they do with digital health can transform patient care. 
And then this leads on to a couple of um, new things that are developing now, and it's very exciting. So colleagues in Northern Ireland, uh, the Republic of Ireland and Australia have worked, done some amazing work, which I talk about on a competency framework. And this is where the leadership really starts to, to, starts to gear, gear up a little bit. Um, there are uh, five areas in a nurse or midwife's career uh, where they can start deploying digital health practices from the very entry level after they've graduated, where they can understand data management and governance and understand the importance of um, supporting nurse decision making with, with data and uh, with new technologies right through to being a change agent, an advocate, a leader, and finally a strategist. And this is where I think the role of the Chief Nurse Information Officer uh, is comes in. And I finished the chapter by talking a little bit about CNIOs or their equivalent. And the CNIO could also be a Chief Clinical Information Officer. And of course we have Chief Midwife Information Officers as well. But the very important thing about the leadership of uh, these CNIO or equivalent individuals is they have developed through their, their work and their practice the confidence to engage with other people in their trust or healthcare organization who um, are in between them they lead a digital health strategy across the whole organization and this is going to become more and more important as um, as you'll know uh, Tim Ferriss, NHS England Transformation Directorate, has got ambitions for hospitals to start introducing across the board electronic health records. Now, if that's going to happen successfully, the first group of people who need to be engaged in that decision making are the nurse and midwife professionals in that hospital. And so they need to provide that specific nurse and midwifery counsel to the senior team uh, and in, a, in order to then articulate and describe the future state we'll find ourselves in. And then of course we have the very fact of having a CNIO in a hospital structure demonstrates the importance of digital health and the way in which the hospital or the healthcare setting is giving that the, the importance of putting that person in the C-suite and making sure that they have that ability to have that impact and influence across the whole organization. So really exciting times and, I, and uh, lots to talk about in the chapter and I do hope you'll take a chance to look at that. And then I've also put in there in the reference list, very in helpful links to further information about where you can get more help and training on this as well. And I finished the chapter by saying that if Florence Nightingale was alive today, she'd be a digital health nurse. Of course, I think she would be. And also I think she'd be a data scientist. You'll be familiar with the fact that Florence was um, a statistician as well as being the founder of modern nursing. And she used data all the time to understand what was going on and to start sorting out some of those issues and problems um, with the way in which care was delivered. And we're all, we all benefit from that now. And wouldn't it have been interesting if she'd been alive now to think about how she would have tackled the COVID pandemic and the way in which uh, nurses and midwives were deployed so effectively across that. So uh, that's my very brief introduction to my chapter, and I look forward to working with many of you, uh, particularly the digital scholars and the Florence Nightingale Foundation uh, in future years. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So, so much, Jane. Jane, what would you say to you people perhaps on the call that are thinking, oh, this chapter's not for me. I'm not a techie. I don't really understand uh, this kind of area or, or kind of distancing themselves from some of the progress that's made in digital transformation? Well, I think it's a totally understandable position to have, first of all. And part of my work is to make sure that as many people as possible don't think that and start to change their minds about the fact that I believe everyone, every nurse and midwife is a digital health expert. And as, as I said at the beginning of my, of my session just now, because nurses and midwives are collecting data all the time and data is just another word for information. So don't be put off by the word data. Don't be put off by uh, imposter syndrome as we've already discussed on the call today. Because you are working with this information, because you have the whole picture of your patient. And I think ultimately because this is a way to improve patient care. It's our duty to understand as much as we can about digital health. And the other thing about it is, it's very exciting. It opens doors uh, to other jobs and other, other aspects of, of a nurse or midwife's career, which you probably haven't even thought about now. But because it's a fast moving world, 
these changes are happening quickly. And as Natasha Phillips, the Chief Nurse Information Officer for England will tell you, um, it's important that we all understand those benefits and they will all touch us eventually in our careers. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks again, Jane. No it's problem. a wonderful contribution to the book. So our final chapter is a chapter that actually I wrote this one and this one is around sharing our knowledge and establishing our expertise through writing. Now there are loads and loads of resources out there which help and guide you through the writing for publication process. Yet we still see many of our nurses and midwives again at all stages of their career from early career right through to the very executive and senior leaders with a real reluctance to write for publication. So this is a different approach to this topic and um, to, to the ones that you might see in other places. It's not a how-to guide. It's very much about understanding again that internal motivation, really connecting with the why it's important for you to share the knowledge that you have this unique expertise that we hold as nurses and midwives and why it's so important and central to our practice and our leadership that we share that knowledge more widely. So the chapter takes you through some, again, uh, self-awareness type exercises, which help us to unpick some of the barriers personally, cognitively, psychologically, that's holding us back, thinking about our ability or our motivation to write for publication. For every single one of us, it always feels like it gets put to the bottom of the priority list. And all of the other tasks that require our immediate attention are um, prioritized. So it really takes a different way of thinking to recognize that this is so, so important that we share this knowledge. And might, that might be because you have implemented a change that has made a significant difference to the care of the patients, the people, the women, the children, the babies that you're, you're looking after. And it's essential to you that you spread this knowledge more widely. Or perhaps you can see that a particular path is being taken in relation to education, workforce, policy, and you've got an opinion on that. And that's an opinion based on your experience. And you feel really compelled to share that opinion more widely through a blog piece or a debate piece in one of the, the nursing press. Whatever that motivation is for you, it's about really channeling that energy it gives you and prioritizing that time to write. The other area that the chapter really explores is some of those self-limiting beliefs that we apply to ourselves, but also we can have imposed upon us, which makes us doubt our ability and also our permission to write for publication. So for many of us, myself included, we were perhaps labelled in a certain way uh, in, our, in our formative years through education, maybe not as particularly naturally academic, and that might be a reason why many of us have gone down a vocational path in terms of our career. But actually, when we start to pull that to pieces and unpick it a little bit, actually there's huge amounts that we have of valid information to share. And with the right support and the right structures around us, we all have the capability to be able to do that. The other thing is we might perceive some people as being able to do this, it comes naturally to them. It's something they find uh, easier than, than, than someone like me. And sometimes when we look at people's CV and it's a, it's a PhD and it's many, many publications, we assume that that's the case. But actually what we try to do in this chapter is to recognize that part of the process of, of writing is about rejection and in some cases, failed attempts but each one of those offers us a really valuable source of feedback that once we've brushed ourselves up and picked ourselves back up again, gives us real insight that we can build on and improve and better our writing going forward. So it's not your average approach. It very much is along the lines of, again, looking at ourselves, developing our self-awareness, understanding what those beliefs are that are stopping us, really prioritizing this 
and then really trying to connect with that internal motivation to want to get out our message and, and share our knowledge more widely and seeing that as important as any other of the leadership, leadership attributes that we've discussed and described so far today. So that's the final chapter of our book. And, and then myself and Greta really conclude the book by sharing what we see as the key messages uh, that the book uh, really follows through the whole uh, themes, the golden threads that pull through the through the, the textbook and really helping you to think about how you can really maximize your opportunities to develop yourself through your confidence, your self-awareness, your emotional intelligence, and, and the kinds of practical approaches that you can utilize to do that. So we hope that you have found this information insightful and we will share this PowerPoint. I do have some exciting news. As I said at the beginning, this is the first of a series of books. And this next one in the series uh, is a book that I've edited uh, in collaboration with Holly Blake from the University of Nottingham. This is focused around well-being. It's a book, again, very practically orientated. There are 25 chapters in this book, short and um, very accessible in the way that they're written from every angle of this topic of well-being, um, from how to support people in your teams that are fasting due to their cultural beliefs, how to support uh, people that are coming towards the end of their career, so the different lifespan, various different uh, structures and um, approaches to supporting reflective practice. There's a real, real array of different topics covered in this book, and this one will be published in January. Now, we do have some time, not very much time, but uh, probably 10 minutes or so just to take some questions. And I'm going to just stop sharing my slide and ask my fellow authors to join me on screen now, those of you that have been able to stay. I did spot uh, a question very early in the conversation there that was around the difference between management and leadership. And I'm just wondering, um, first of all, Greta, could I ask you to perhaps share your thoughts around how we might distinguish those two things. Thank you, and um, I too spotted that question. I, I, I wonder if there is any distinction. I think if we can lead, we can also manage. I think the traditional word management is to do with the situation that we might manage on the ward, but actually manages our leaders. And I, I, I think uh, maybe we should move away from the word manager to the word leader, mm -hmm. and and actually, on a lot of um, health healthcare organisations now, they've started to use the word team leader, not mm -hmm. team manager, or ward leader, not ward ward manager. So um, I would advocate that managers are leaders, and this book and other books are available. This book particularly will help um, those readers to understand how they can enhance their leadership skills. And, and hopefully they won't ask that question again, but Johnny, really, really good question. And I think, I think it is confused sometimes, but my, my thesis is um, we are leaders, even if we have to manage people, we should be leaders. Thanks, Greta. I often think when we, we talk about management, it feels like we're managing an environment or a resource or a problem. Whereas when I think about leadership, I, I think about people and relationships. And actually, if we think about it all being underpinned by people and relationships, then all of those other areas fit in underneath that umbrella. So I think you're right. Perhaps we need to stop talking about a division there. There's a nod there from you, Claire. Would you agree? Oh, you're on mute. Thank Sorry, you. 100%. I think it's it's really important because I think it is. We, every, the people are leaders are all different parts. Diff, whatever they do, they're leaders in different ways. So I, I think that we need to, yeah, definitely get rid of that, that division. Thank you. Jane, anything you wanted to add? Yes, thank you, Gemma. I think in, particularly in, in digital health, where, as discussed already, it's a very new idea for many people. A leader in this space would be somebody who is able to describe the vision of what we're going towards with digital health and any other implementation they're, they're responsible for. And also 
be do that with such conviction and honesty and authenticity because they are themselves uh, involved in that process that people automatically choose to follow them and it's that fellowship not leadership that we're talking about here when people actually think this person is authentic they understand the they're what, what's involved here. I trust them to uh, lead us through this next uh, period of time or the implementation or whatever's going on. And for me, that's real true leadership is having that, that uh, ability to make people choose to follow you uh, and because they want to and not because they've been told to by a manager. Brilliant, thank you, wonderful. And one final question I think probably we've got time to take was around the MBTI greeter and IVS specifically if the were particular limitations to that as a tool for exploring personality and preference? I think we should probably say this is just a one call, one, one tool to explore personality um, preferences. There are many other tools, but we use this, I, I guess we use the MBTI because it's most accessible. Um, it's most researched. Gemma and I come from a, a clinical academic background. We like data. Um, we, we want to make sure that our work is evidence-based and the, my, the MBTI is evidence-based. It's been translated in hundreds of, not hundreds, lots of languages and it's been used thousands of times and it's, I think it's reported to be the most used organisational development tool to, um, up to understand self. So that's the basis of we use it, but there are certainly other tools and of course it will have its limitations. You know, we can't equally always fit into 16 little boxes, but I think it does a really good job. And of course it's based on Carl Jung's theory of, of behavior. So it is, it is, it is the, the best version that I think we can, we, and actually when you go to read your Myers-Briggs little, even a little summary, a little cameo, how can they get that so right? So, but yeah, it, it is incredible and it does a really good job. And I think for those who are interested in it, it sparks an interest to up, try and understand more. So yeah, it's a good starting block, but, and it's the basis of our programmes, but there are others that you, people use. Brilliant, thank you, Greta. So just really finally to say, you will have identified that theme of self-awareness throughout this whole uh, book. And, and Jane mentioned in her response just recently around that authenticity. And one of the things that we identified in this book was around uh, inclusivity and that importance of the diversity of a voice and approach to leadership. So whereas there isn't a specific chapter on that particular uh, issue around leadership, what we have attempted to do through the book is to really and emphasize every single opportunity that leadership has many voices and every individual that we hope engages with the book will really see that they have potential. And whereas they will identify their role models out there, they won't be the same as their role models because they come with their own individual attributes, values, motivations, and it's about them finding how, how they can be the best leader that they can be. So we really, really hope you'll take the opportunity to, to pre-order the book while there is a discount on it. It will be released in September. And um, at that point, we will uh, hope to advertise it widely and just raise awareness of it again. But thank you to every single one of you that's joined. The chat has been going crazy and with endorsements for the, the principles that our authors are, uh, are really putting through their chapters. So we thank you so, so much. And we really, really hope that you enjoy reading the book as much as we've enjoyed putting it all together. Thank you, everybody.